What follows is the acceptance speech that I gave when, on the 18th of November last month, I was in Washington, D.C. at the Freer Gallery of Art, receiving the Charles Lang Freer Medal. Here I am with Julian Raby, director of the Freer, as I was given the medal. The Freer Medal is given to distinguished scholars in Asian art. It's been presented intermittently since 1956. I was the 12th recipient, the 6th for Chinese art. The five before me were Siren, Sikman, Lur, Soper, and Sherman Lee. Others were for Japanese and Near Eastern art. Uh, they couldn't really give me the medal itself, a bronze relief disc designed by the sculptor Paul Menship, because they've temporarily lost them and are casting more. Uh, what I'm holding is a cardboard reproduction. It was no less an honor for that, of course. Uh, next, please. I spoke for the first 10 minutes or so without pictures, but for this video version, I'll add a few more pictures and add also some commentary on the pictures as they appear. I'm not so pressed for time now as I was at the Freer presentation. I should add that a written out form of the lecture with lots of bibliographical references for publications that I cite will be on my website before long. So now I begin with the actual text of my Freer Medal Address, uh, Acceptance Address. Okay, here we go. I must begin by expressing my feelings of extreme pleasure and honor at receiving the, this prestigious and unexpected award. That unexpected is real. Looking over the list of previous recipients, I could scarcely imagine myself joining it, including as it does among the Chinese art specialists, that is, so many of my teachers and heroes. I knew all of them, learned from them, interacted with them, and feel now that I am here as a very old person, next please, like Dustin Hoffman at the beginning of Little Big Man, who has somehow survived to tell the tale and had best do it while he still can. That's a picture of Dustin Hoffman made up as very old on the right. I'm at the left, uh, the one with the glasses. I think you can still tell us apart. Okay. Um, next, please. That feeling of pleasure and honor was my first reaction on receiving Julian Raby's letter, and I suppose it was normal enough. My second and third are odder, and one at least needs to be explained. First, it struck me that almost exactly one Chinese cycle of 60 years, which is, as many of you know, the way they measure long stretches of history, has passed since I first arrived at the Freer in the autumn of 1950, with a new bachelor's degree in Oriental Languages from the University of California in Berkeley and a Hackney scholarship. And secondly, an odder thought, that someone with a very sharp ear for prose style, reading the 1965 address of the third recipient, Yukio Yashiro, and that of the twelfth, myself, might detect a curious similarity between them. Next, please. And that is because they were, that is the English text of Yashiro's, and this is one of mine, written by the same person, myself. A prominent Japanese art scholar in Tokyo like Yashiro, faced with the need for giving a talk in English, would be likely to bring his Japanese text for translation to the dealer Mayoyama Ryu Sendo, who performed many such services for art scholars. Next, here's a picture of Mayoyama's store, Ryu Sendo, near Kyobashi in uh, Tokyo, known to many of you. And while Junkichi Mayoyama and his young assistants, in suits and neckties, entertained customers and showed them works of art on the lower floors of Ryu Sendo, my close friend and Tokyo sake bar drinking companion, Haruo Igaki, worked away in shirt sleeves on the top floor, handling much of the firm's correspondence, keeping accounts, and doing translations when needed. And I, whenever I was in Tokyo, where I spent a lot of time since it was my favorite city in all the world, often helped him by rewriting English texts, as I did with Yashiro's, working from the Japanese original and Igaki's rough English rendering. So I knew it before it was delivered, and was deeply impressed by the story that it tells. I will return to that later. But next, please. Louise Wallace Hackney wanted the scholarship she funded to train young specialists in doing the kind of work she herself had done in cataloging the Chinese painting collection of Ada Small Moor, a collection now at Yale University. She had cataloged it, that is, together with a Chinese collaborator who could read the inscriptions, identify the seals, 
use textual sources for the artist's biographies, and otherwise construct full entries for the paintings. It was acceptable in those days for a non-Chinese reading author to co-write a book with a Chinese collaborator. Agnes Meyer, one of the original Friends of the Freer, had done it with her book on Li Gong Lin. Sir Percival David, the poet Witter Binner, and many others had done it also. Hackney's collaborator was C.F. Yao, the dealer who had sold Moore most of her paintings. Fortunately for him, he did not need to deal with questions of authenticity. Serious concern with that was still a project for the future. Hackney specified that the recipient of her scholarship spend a year at a museum with a strong Chinese painting collection, learning to catalog Chinese paintings using Chinese language sources. The recipient needed, of course, to have studied literary Chinese, as I had. The age of depending on Chinese collaborators was ending. I was the first holder of the Hackney Scholarship, although it had been offered for five years, no qualified applicant had appeared before. I worked mainly with Archibald Wenley, the director of the Freer at that time, and received a good grounding in producing what at the Freer were called folder sheets, putting together just that kind of information for the paintings. It is a project I still believe to be an important part of Chinese painting studies. <laughs> After my hackney year at the Freer, however, I was fortunate enough to enjoy a succession of opportunities for learning other approaches, all by sheer good luck. I never, as I realized later, made a conscious decision about the directions I would pursue or the scholarships I would apply for. I had neared the end of my undergraduate studies in Oriental languages at Berkeley with no clear idea of where I would go from there, only a vague notion that I would become a translator of Japanese literature and do for Heike Morogatari what Weili had done for Genji. Then my teacher, Ed Schaefer, pointed out a notice of the Hackney Scholarship in the back pages of an issue of the Journal of the American Oriental Society, and knowing that Chinese painting was one of my interests, urged me to apply for it. After my year at the Freer, I moved on for further study, more or less automatically, to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which has close academic ties with the Freer. Next, please. And by supreme good fortune, I arrived just as Max Lohr came there to teach, and was sitting in the front row at his first lecture. Through Lohr, I was exposed to the great German tradition of art history, which he represented at the highest level for Chinese art scholarship in his generation. After taking a master's degree at Michigan in 1953, I was awarded, after applying on the urging of one of the faculty there, a Metropolitan Fellowship to study museum practice for a year at the Muse Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Next, please. And during that year, besides working with Alan Priest, Ashwin Lippi, and others at the Met, you see here, by the way, pictures with them. It's a picture of, at the left of um, Alan Priest in the foreground, behind him John Pope. They're on a trip in Japan to choosing works for an exhibition. And at the right, uh, Ashwin Lippi. Ashwin Lippi actually prints uh, uh, a prince. He, his real name was Ernst Ostrom Prince Lippi Biesterfeld. He was the prince of a defunct principality near Holland or Germany. And um, anyway, um, and he's seen here looking very much the European aristocrat with his equally aristocratic and elegant wife. Anyway, these are the two of them. Okay. Um, besides working with Alan Priest, Ashran Lippi, and others at the Met, I found myself spending a lot of time with Wang Ji Chen, or Cici Wang, next please, uh, who represented for his generation traditional Chinese connoisseurship at its highest level. I was later to spend many days with Wang at the Freer, at the Palace Museum, Storage in Taichung, and elsewhere, looking at paintings together. That is how one learned from him. And then, again on someone's advice, I applied for and received a Fulbright scholarship to Japan and spent a year in Kyoto working with, next please, Shimada Shujiro, learning from him something of the great Japanese tradition of dealing with Chinese paintings. Shimada took me to visit such notable collectors as Sumitomo, Takashima, and, next please, Kawabata Yasunari. Here's a picture of him, the great novelist, to my, uh, on my website, a story about how I, a oh, wonderful overnight I had with uh, Kawabata and how I got to know him anyway. Um, to see the paintings that they owned. 
And again, I learned mainly by looking and listening through all these viewing sessions. While I was in Kyoto, Oswald Siren, next please, came there and persuaded me to come to Stockholm at the end of my Fulbright year to work for him, and I agreed. And the picture here, by the way, shows one of those viewing sessions of which we used to have so many in Japan. You would visit a family or a whatever that uh, owned paintings, and then you'd spend part of the day uh, looking at them. Sometimes rolled out on the floor as here. This is Seren. This is at the Kurokawa Institute in Ashiya, uh, in uh, near Kobe in Japan. And uh, uh, to the far right is of course Shimada. And he uh, took us there. I was actually along on this trip too, but I don't appear in the photo anyway. Seren is not one of my heroes, and I can't say I learned much of real value from him. As a pupil of Bernard Berenson, to whom Berenson assigned the role of doing for Chinese painting what he himself had done for Italian painting, Seren should have developed a connoisseur's penetrating eye for Chinese painting. Next, please. This is a picture of Seren in his Chinese garden. But as Alexander Soper pointed out in a review published while Seren was still alive, he never did never did develop the connoisseur's eye, that is. Um, and he ended as a tireless gatherer, assembling photographs, appropriating information and translations without compunction from others, in producing weighty but not deeply perceptive books on Chinese art. Next, picture of myself when young, just to represent the young Cahill, okay? Tra traveling in Europe after my three months in Stockholm, however, brought me into contact with many collectors, scholars, and dealers, such as Jean-Pierre Dubas, who, with Laurent Sickman, introduced Ming Ching painting to the U.S. I was later to compare myself to the Buddhist pilgrim Sudana, who goes about the universe seeking out the great bodhisattvas to receive their teaching. Back at the Freer, I finished my doctoral dissertation, devoting half of it to a first attempt in any Western language to lay out the theoretical foundations of one Renhua or literati painting, uh, scholar amateur painting, introducing numerous quotations I had found by browsing through old Chinese books in the Freer Library. This was very much a text reader's project. I became, in my excitement over opening up this new subject area, virtually a partisan of literati painting, working to introduce it to readers and viewers unfamiliar with it. I was struck for one thing by its divorcement of the work's expression from its representational content as a picture and its reliance instead on the expressiveness of gesture, in which it seems strikingly to parallel or predict the abstract expressionist painting that was just then flourishing here. More recently in my later life, my engagement with this doctrine of scholar amateur painting has turned around to make me more a critic than a proponent of it, as I have come to realize how badly it has blocked our appreciation of other kinds of Chinese paintings and worked against their survival. Next, please. In the 1950s, however, my role as a spokesman for literati painting enabled me to become a member of the remarkable team put together by John Fairbank and others to produce a series of symposia and volumes on Confucianism. My contribution, presented at a 1958 conference in the series, was an essay titled Confucian Elements in the Theory of Painting. Next. And it was largely in this context that I came to know the great historian Joseph Levinson, who would briefly become a good friend and colleague when we both taught at UC Berkeley before his tragic early death, and who would have a profound impact on my way of thinking and working. Next. Before continuing, I want to talk of the extraordinary sense of camaraderie enjoyed by all of us at the Freer at that time. Wenli, although one cannot claim him as a major innovative scholar, was a very effective administrator, besides being a man of deep moral principle. Relations within the staff that served under him were on the whole harmonious. Here's a uh, group photo of the Freer staff taken uh, well, I'll talk about the occasion in a bit. I'm not going to identify everybody here, but just for those who want to know, a few of the people. At the far left in the front is uh, Liz West, who was John Gettin's assistant in the technical lab. She was a scientist. Behind her 
with a bow tie and the glasses myself. Uh, down in front, George Kuayama, who was a fellowship student at that time, and then went on to become a curator at, the, at LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, for many years. Behind him to the right, tall person, is Richard Eddinghausen, the first curator of Near Eastern Art, and the little boy in front of him is his son. Next to Eddinghausen in the back is Russell Milkey, who, was, who headed the Freer, well, support staff, the people who did carpentry and all the rest of the things like that. And in front of him is Takashi Sugiura, the Freer mounter at that time. Just to the right of them, partly cut off, uh, just uh, looking over somebody's head, is Harold Philip Stern, Japanese art specialist who became the director of the Freer for a time. Behind him, up to the right with glasses, is uh, John Gettens of the Freer Technical Laboratory. In front of them are a group of the Freer women. I won't identify all of them, but uh, Mrs. Westlake is one of them. Over on the right, sort of turned partly inward and wearing a dark dress, is Bertha Usselton, who was the librarian of the Freer, an important person. Uh, between them and looking over their shoulder is, of course, Archibald Wenley of the glasses. And the person at the back, highest way up there, looking over everybody, is Burns A. Stubbs, about who I'm going to talk now. Okay, the really indispensable person at the Freer at that early period was the remarkable Burns A. Stubbs, next please, <clears throat> who had come to the Freer as a guard, but who had mastered so many skills and taken on so many functions over the years, managing the storage and installation of objects, doing the Freer's photography, writing the text to the Peacock Room pamphlet, that it was unclear how the Freer could continue without him when he, when he retired in 1956. This photo is uh, of his retirement, uh, retirement party, him be, being handed a gift of some kind by Arch Wenley. Um, next. I myself made an album of 20 clumsily drawn pictures for presentation to him on that occasion. Here you see uh, Stubbs holding one of the leaves and laughing at it, and Arch Wenley and his wife uh, beside him. Anyway, um, they showed him in, the exa in these examples. I'll have to show several of them. Next, please. Uh, teaching a new arrival at the Freer, that is Arch Wenley, about Chinese paintings. He's pointing to a hanging scroll, of course, at the left. Next, please. Photographing the Freer bronzes. Uh, the one you see he's, that he's photographing is an actual example. I'll put, a, put it also on the screen. A real bronze, which quite unique, which has a human head, human face, that is, with bottle horns on, as a cover and the body of a serpent that goes around it anyway, and, and uh, Stubbs photographing that. Next, please. Um, Writing the catalog of Whistler prints and drawings, he also wrote the pamphlet for another Whistler work, The Peacock Room, uh, as he is shown doing here. Next, please. Yes, here's The Peacock Room. I won't start talking about that. The story of The Peacock Room, a wonderful story. I could go on for half an hour at least. Uh, terrific, sort of like a Max Beerbohm story anyway. And next, please. And finally, Stubbs leading the annual procession through the heating duct tunnel to the main Smithsonian building, bearing objects considered for purchase, which had to be shown to the Smithsonian regents at their annual meeting, but could not, by the terms of Freer's will, be taken out of the building. This was the curious expedient for circumventing these conflicting requirements. This is a, something that really happened. I mean, obviously, the tree roots and the skeleton I added, but uh, essentially it's a picture of something that really happened. Next, please. Lawrence Sickman, photograph of him here at the left as a young man visiting a dealer in China, and at the right, later in his life, as the director of the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City. Lawrence Sickman came sometimes to the Freer, um, and I got to know him in various contexts as a good friend. I would sometimes stop overnight in Kansas City on my way across the country. This was before non-stop flights were common. And Larry would put me up in his modest but comfortable house. We spent a lot of time looking at paintings together. Among his strengths was the breadth of his tastes and his expertise in areas of Chinese art ignored by most others. Next, please. Um, 
including furniture. Here's a bed that he bought for the Nelson Gallery. And what he called dongxi, things or objects. These tastes he had absorbed during his years in China. Here are two tomb figurines, a wooden figurine from Changsha and another Han figurine. Um, and I was one of the teams that Larry brought together in 1960-61 to 61 to catalog the newly formed Crawford collection of Chinese paintings and calligraphy. Next, please. Other visitors to the Freer included Zhang Da Chen. Here is a self-portrait of his, who had been in Japan during my Fulbright year there and whom I'd come to know well. We conversed in our one common language, Japanese, in which both of us were fairly fluent. Zhang had lived in Japan for several years in his early life. Uh, he, Zhang had advised and encouraged me in my first major purchase of a Chinese painting for my own collection. Next, please. This is a fisherman scroll, hand scroll, by Wu Wei. This is a section of it. I needed support before putting out the purchase price, which was around $150, a big amount then for a Fulbright student. Next, please. This photograph was made on the Freer Steps in 1958 after one of Zhang's visits. With him, besides myself, the person with protruding ears and the bow tie, are his wife and his son and his artist disciple, Mrs. Fang Zhaoling. Next, please. Uh, I had become aware of Zhang's forgeries of early Chinese paintings already while in Japan, and even more in Hong Kong and Paris on the way home. Besides identifying one of them among recent Freer purchases after my return. Next, please. This is one of the figures in the hand scroll titled Three Worthies of Wu Zhong, bought while I was away. Detecting Zhang's forgeries of old paintings had become an important project for me. Zhang and I remained friends. I thought of him as a respected adversary with whom I was playing a high-level game. But in time, I began to worry that too much of the limited funds available to major museums for purchasing early Chinese paintings was being spent on Zhang's fakes, and I set about trying to expose him, a project too long and complex even to outline here. Uh, next, please. His daughter, Sing, seen with him in this photo from his last year, was for a time my student. It was also in the late 1950s and early 60s that I was engaged in a series of large projects involving the National Palace Museum collection in Taiwan. Next, please. Which at that time was stored in an old sugarcane factory some miles outside Taichung. It was only in 1965 that the present Palace Museum buildings outside Taipei were open and the collection moved there. Here it shows them in their, the, the objects are still in their original crates in which they were shipped long before and from Beijing. Um, I visited it briefly in 1955 to see Chinese, Yuan Dynasty paintings for my dissertation. Next, please. In 1958 and 59, I was back together with C.C. C. Wong to choose paintings to reproduce, most of them for the first time in color, in the book Chinese Painting that I was writing for Albert Skira. The person next to me uh, in the photo is Henry Bevel, the photographer for the National Gallery and Skira's favorite photographer. It's, of course, C.C. Wong at the other end, at the, at the left of this group. Uh, Li Lin Song next to him, Zhuang Yan, the director in the middle, anyway. All right. Um, in 1961, the great exhibition Chinese Art Treasures came to the National Gallery with a catalog written mostly by John Pope and myself at the Freer and Ashwin Lippi at the Met. Here we are at the opening, Pope at the right end, myself at the left, Ashwin Lippi next to me, and Henry Bevel again uh, with uh, the person with the glasses, all holding copies of the exhibition catalog. I organized a post-mortem symposium in 1962 as a follow-up to that exhibition to discuss controversial paintings that had been in it this went on for two days in the basement auditorium of Asia House Gallery. Next, please. These are the page, the opening pages of the transcript, which eventually, soon, I'm going to put on my website. Okay. I sat at the head table along with Larry Sickman and Astro Lippi, choosing slides to show and inviting opinions about the paintings from the assembled scholars, who included just about everybody in Chinese painting studies at that time. It was our first grand gathering. 
Helping us by running slides and recording the proceedings were young grad students from Princeton with names like John Hay and Roderick Whitfield. <laughs> uh, change, please. The two days of highly stimulating discussion began with this uh, well-known painting, which uh, is a copy after a Tong period landscape, which Max Lur and Alex Soper dated exactly a millennium apart, Max in the 8th century, Alec in the 18th. This demonstrated how far from agreement we scholars still were, to the dismay of some dealers and collectors in the audience. The event was funded with a $750 grant I had applied for and received from the ACLS committee that I served on, and I returned some of the money unspent. I didn't know any better. The great age of big spending symposia still lay ahead. Next, please. For the winter of 1962-3, I organized, with much help from Dick Edwards at the University of Michigan, seen here at the left, a large-scale project to photograph paintings in that greatest of collections, which was still stored outside Taichung. Ray Schwartz of the Freer was the photographer this time. A side project assigned to me by women employees of the Freer before we left was to find a wife for Ray, who was 40 still unmarried, and very shy, next. Both projects were highly successful. Here you see Ray and his future wife, Jenny, a few minutes before he proposed to her. We had taken them on an outing to an obscure and scenic river gorge north of Taichung, since she could not be seen with him in public. Accompanying us as seen here was my then wife, Dorothy, and our children, Nicholas and Sarah. Ray and Jenny were married in Taipei, and she returned with him to D.C., to Washington, where they lived together until his recent death. The photographs from this project were deposited at the University of Michigan, becoming the original basis for the Asian Art Photographic Distribution Service there. Next, please. Yes. Um, during my last years at the Freer, up to my departure in 1965, I was an active participant in another major project, project producing the Freer Bronze Catalog, which was not published until 1967, but was in preparation during those years. My role was to write the sections on style and dating. John Pope, the overall editor, generously assigned me this job in spite of his own skepticism about the value of style studies of the kind I had learned from Max Lurer. Noel Barnard, who was with us working on the inscriptions, always scoffed at style studies as purely subjective, matters of feeling with no sound basis, as he put it. Next, please. Lurer had by this time published in 1953 his modest but epical study of the bronze styles of the Anyang period, but it was only later that Alexander Soper and others would come to recognize the triumph of stylistic studies that it represented, using as it did the concept of an internal logic of development to define the earliest pre onyang styles of bronze decor before archaeology proved him right, where the three great text and inscription readers of his time, an archaeologist, one of them, Umehara, Karlgren, and Li Ji, had all got it wrong. The pictures I'm showing are from a book by Robert Bagley of Princeton University, who was also a Lur disciple and student, like myself, a book that deals with this matter and with Lur's studies of Chinese bronzes in general. Next, please. John Pope had recognized an age of division in his famous Sinology or Art History article, published in 1947, which was in large part a highly negative assessment of the work of Lurer's teacher, Ludwig Bachhofer, seen here, who indeed had written on Chinese art without being able to read Chinese. Next, please. <clears throat> but the issue became moot in the generation of Max Lurer and Alexander Soper, scholars who were trained and accomplished in both Sinology and art history, and who set models for all the, all the rest of us who followed them, for whom the same dual competence has come to be routinely expected. I have arrived at last at what is really the underlying theme of this talk, that is the Sinology or art history controversy, although relegated to the past in the training of specialist scholars, continues in a new form as a deep division between basic approaches, defined now as verbal versus visual, using your eyes mainly to read texts or using them mainly to look at works of art. 
Unhappily, it has assumed a dimension of false cultural pride. Some scholars, especially in China, argue that visual kinds of art history represent a foreign intrusion that should be resisted in favor of what they see as a traditional Chinese emphasis on research and texts. The next, please. I've tried to show the wrongness of that belief in an argument of my own that cannot be repeated here at length. You can read it on my website. In short, I argue that the great theorists and critics, such as Dong Chi Chang, who wrote the texts on which the verbal approach largely depends, in fact spent as much of their time as they could looking at paintings. Um, here we see a detail from a painting by the Ming artist Xu Ying showing Chinese scholars looking at paintings and other antiquities. Next, please. <clears throat> but in that pre-photography age, there was no way that they could transmit the benefits of their deep visual engagement with these paintings in their writings. So we get a false and much reduced sense of what these writers really knew and believed about painting. Uh, on the screen, the images on the right, uh, a portrait of Dong Chi Chang becoming a, uh, an official or dreaming of becoming an official. And on the left, a section of a painting attributed to Wang Wei, which is one of the things he most admired. Okay, next please. Here, back to Yashiro. I want to return now to the story told in Yukio Yashiro's Freer Metal Paper, which concerns Charles Lang Freer's second visit to Japan in the summer of 1907. In what follows, I depend also on information from Tom Lawton's writings and his greatly valued help, as well as on an unpublished paper by Ingrid Larson, which she generously made available to me. Next, please. Yashiro tells how his relative, Nomoro Yuzo, met Freer when his boat docked in Yokohama, rescuing him from a customs official who was giving him trouble, and took him to the villa of the great collector Hara Tomitaro, who later introduced him to another major collector, Masuda Takashi. Alas, Freer's diary of that year, to which I've had access through the kindness of Mr. David Hogg, contradicts most of Yashiro's entertaining story. Either he or Nomura must have misremembered. Next. Freer arrived in Kobe, not Yokohama, had no special customs problems, and did not meet Nomura until later. But it is true that the introduction to Hara had come from Nomura, and that Freer spent two weeks living in Hara's villa outside Yokohama, seeing works of art, and later spent a lot of time doing the same with Matsuda, Masuda and others, other prominent collectors in Tokyo. Neither Hara nor Masuda was an academic scholar. Both of them were rich businessmen who had refined their connoisseurial eyes through collecting. Yashiro's point, which I believe still has much validity, was that this, these two were instrumental in introducing Freer to what they took to be, and what we still recognize as, the loftier levels of taste in Chinese and Japanese art. Early Japanese emaki and yamato-e, the paintings of sotatsu in the Rinpo school in Japan, Japanese tea wares, early Chinese paintings. Next, please. The tea wares were not new to Freer, who had already acquired notable examples of Japanese ceramics. The two on the screen, uh, a koetsu tea bowl at left and a fine piece of shino ware at right, are from 1899 and 1902, and he had already disposed of all his Japanese prints and generally moved away from the kind of fin de siècle taste or japonoiserie that he had learned from Whistler and others. His triumphs of acquisition in Emaki and Rimpa I don't need and I haven't time to remind you of. For tea wares, I will only recall those exciting days when I accompanied and helped Koyama Fujio as he went through the cabinets in the Freer's Japanese ceramic storage room. Others to whom I had opened those cabinets had glanced quickly over the contents before signaling that I should close them again. The first Freer director, John Lodge, had taken all the pots out of their inscribed boxes. He hated this idea of box connoisseurship. And he put all the boxes in the basement where they were lost. For box readers, close relatives for ceramics of text readers for paintings, this effectively robbed the pots of interest and value. Koyama, who was himself an accomplished potter, used his eyes and his fingers to judge the pots themselves, and he found unrecognized treasures among them. Next, please. <clears throat> I do want, however, to join Lawton and Larson in recognizing Freer's extraordinary achievement 
in acquiring early Chinese paintings. Larson and others emphasized for this the influence of Ernest Fenollosa, who was seen on the right here. Um, and I don't dispute that Fenollosa's high regard for Sung painting, his disdain for what he called the literary formalism that afflicted much painting from the Yuan and later, must have set Freer initially in this direction. Fenollosa had given Freer introductions to people in Japan and assured him that, quote, you may safely trust to your own judgment of paintings better than anybody's, end quote. But that was a Yankee boast, recognizable from our vantage point as for both men in 1906, still far from true. For Freer's development as a connoisseur of early Chinese painting, next please, I would still incline to see his experience of that summer in Japan as crucial. <clears throat> he himself suggests as much in a letter he wrote in 1909 from Peking, quoted by Lawton and Larson, in which he writes this, quote, Thanks to Fenelosa's superior teachings and the splendid opportunities given me in Japan during the summer of 1907, when I saw practically all of the early Chinese paintings owned publicly and privately in Japan, I knew what to search for when I began my quest here, I mean Peking, end quote. From old records, we can determine the Sung paintings that Hara and Masuda owned, and they probably showed to Freer. Um, here are two of them, the bird, the uh, qui excuse me, dove on a peach branch on the left is supposed to be by the Emperor Huizhen, that was owned by Masuda, and Hara had a painting by Zhao Lingrong of crows roosting in the evening, which is probably the one seen on the right, now in the Yamato Bunka Khan. Okay. Um, next, please. We can guess at what he may have seen elsewhere, again from old records and reproduction books, but also from Freer's diary, in which, like Fenelosa, he uses Japanese pronunciations for the artist's names, Baien, Kake, Barin, and Ryokai, for Ma Yuan, Ma Lit, Ma, uh, Xia Gui, Ma Lin, and Liang Kai. Next, please. Well-known collectors appear there, too, among Freer's hosts, that is, in the diary, Nezu, Marcus Kuroda, Kawasaki, Count Date. For my present purpose, it's enough to say that the Sung works that he might have seen make up a deeply impressive group. Next, please, finally. And I can only add that my own experience over many years of being shown great early Chinese paintings in Japan by Japanese collectors, scholars, and dealers gives me some sense of the benefits that Freer must have derived during that remarkable summer, from doing this over and over, until he had seen, as he writes, nearly all the early Chinese paintings in Japan, in the company of major collectors such as Hara, Masuda, and the others. Next. And that new level of connoisseurship is reflected, I think, in Freer's later purchases. Already in 1908, he bought the Hills in Fog, ascribed to Mi Fu, a work we still use to represent that artist while not quite accepting the attribution. In 1911, uh, the fine and important Misty Gorge, which reportedly had a Shagwe signature, lost in remounting. Uh, next, please. And the earliest extant version of the double screen picture by Zhou Anju, seen here at the left. Uh, another version in, Pe in Beijing at right is a later copy, as Tom Lawton's book on figure painting correctly points out. In 1914, he bought the freer versions of the the freer version of the Gukaiger attributed Nymph of the Law River composition, and in 1916, the clearing autumn skies hand scroll attributed to Guashi, as well as next place, the river in Shu hand scroll ascribed to Li Gonglin, which had been one of the four treasures of the Chenlong Emperor. Quite a few others could be added. And this is leaving out an impressive group of Buddhist, Taoist, and Chan Buddhist paintings among these early acquisitions. Next, please. And all along, Freer was also buying fine and important, if wrongly attributed, Ming Qing paintings, such as this picture of the principles from the drama Xi Xiang Ji, which, if one ignores a preposterous old attribution to Zhou Anju, is a fine work of the kind I call in my recent book, Vernacular Painting. It is, in fact, the picture that opens my last chapter. My point is that no other collector outside Asia had done as well, 
academic scholars such as Fenelosa and Bertold Laufer, or a would-be Chinese-style collector scholar like John Ferguson, were left far behind. Freer's summer of 1907 and its aftermath make up, I believe, a turning point in the history of the appreciation of Chinese painting in the West. Next, please. After my move from the Freer back to UC Berkeley in 1965, now as a professor of Chinese art history, where I was to teach for the next, next 30 years, I was able to organize exhibitions with seminars of graduate students. Here are pictures of me early in that period and late in that period, both of them taken by UC Berkeley photographers for some kind of award I was given or whatever. Anyway, um, seminars of graduate students, notably, next please, the um, Restless Landscape Exhibition of Late Ming Painting in 1971 and the Shadows of Mount Huang exhibition of Anhui School painting in 1981. These are the covers of the catalogs, of course. Some of the students from those and others have gone on to become leading figures in today's world of Chinese painting studies. Next, please. Students in my courses were given regular viewing sessions at the nearby University Art Museum, where we looked at actual paintings and storage close up. In this picture, uh, you will recognize some of them at the far left, uh, Suzanne Wright, and then Scarlett Zhang leaning over looking at the painting, myself, and then at the right, Julia White, who is now the senior curator of Asian art at the Berkeley Art Museum. They changed their name, same museum. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the students were also made aware of what I took to be landmarks in the history of the field. Those in my course on early painting, for instance, always read, next please, uh, Alexander Soper's two art bulletin articles about early Chinese landscape painting and life motion in the sense of space. Um, the picture uh, on the, uh, along with Soper is well, a part of the Nelson Gallery sarcophagus, which is the main subject of the latter article. He is arguing for the date of it. Anyway, um, along with writings by Sickman, Lur, Michael Sullivan, and others. The need for putting together lecture courses on post sung painting led me to undertake a series of volumes on later Chinese painting, of which three were finished and published before I turned to other projects not defined by periods. Next, please. Here I am in Harvard, uh, well, at the time when I gave the Norton Lectures, 1978-9, uh, along with Max Lur and Lena Kim and her uh, boy, anyway. Um, next, please. Uh, these later projects were mostly initiated by I invitations to give lecture series. The Norton Lecture at Harvard in 1978-79, others later. I never wrote a book on early Chinese painting through Song, but my failure to do so was the main impetus behind my present late life project, a series of video recorded lectures titled A Pure and Remote View, Visualizing Early Chinese Landscape Painting. Here I made an aside to the audience saying, a notice about those will be sent out soon to everybody on my email address list. And if there's anybody here who suspects that she or he is not on my email list and would like to receive this notice, give me a note telling who you are and giving me your email address. So, uh, since my retirement in 1995, I've tried to keep on writing. My long delayed book on what I call vernacular painting appeared only recently. Next, please. Um, I also learned a lot while teaching at Berkeley from my Western art colleagues. I was in the fortunate position again, by sheer good luck, of having such colleagues as Svetlana Alpers, Michael Baxendall, and T.J. Clark, Tim Clark. And all of them taught in their different ways the necessity of looking long and hard at the works of art. Svetlana, in her seminal 1977 article called Is Art History? Question mark, makes the crucial observation about all the major art historians she has considered, Clark, Michael Fried, Leo Steinberg, and by implication Baxendall and herself, she writes, quote, more important than the distinctiveness of their approaches is the common claim made by these scholars against the evidence of most art historical writing today that not only research about, but looking at a work takes time. They all show that it took time to look in the past 
and they offer us ways in which it can today, end quote. And if there is anything I would impress with the utmost urgency upon young specialists in Chinese art, it is that. No approach that does not involve prolonged and analytical looking at the work of art and attention to its visual properties can produce an adequate account of it. <clears throat> I have been fond of controversies and sometimes even suspected of being argumentative, a trait one colleague associated with my Irish heritage. The next, please. Questions on which I took a contentious stand include the one about whether a certain pair of landscapes, the Kotoin landscape seen here, could be by Li Tong. I argue that they could not, must be somewhat later. And the one about whether Chinese artists were completely free to paint what they pleased. I have tried to demonstrate the contrary, ways in which they were subject to social and economic constraints that went some way toward determining how and what they painted. Next, please. Presenting the paper that did that at a Wen Zheng Ming Symposium in Ann Arbor in 1976, these are pictures by Wen Zheng and Tong Yin, the two artists who represented the two types in my paper. Uh, presenting this paper introduced me to the guilty pleasure, a kind of scholarly schadenfreude, of confronting one's colleagues with unshakable evidence for something that most of them don't want to believe. Next, please. I was to enjoy that pleasure again in 1978 when I showed in my Norton Lectures at Harvard how much 17th century Chinese painters adopted from European pictorial art. Here, a uh, one of the leaves of Ortelius's Atlas, uh, 1679, is it? Uh, no, uh, 1579, anyway, uh, early, uh, late, late 16th century, which was in China at this time. And on the right, Gongshan's great painting, which is, I think, must be based on this, or painted after he has seen this, inspired by the print. Okay, you know all that. <clears throat> My latest largely unwelcome contention, which I hope will eventually be as generally accepted as those, represents a kind of reversal of my early dedication to literati painting theory. In my recent book on Elsewhere, next please, here's the book, I point out how the field of Chinese literature, in the field of Chinese literature studies, about a century ago, how it abandoned its exclusive dedication to classical literature, essays, studies of the classics, poetry, and the like, to pay attention also to the novel, the drama, courtesan songs, and other forms of popular literature. The outcome has been a huge expansion and deepening of Chinese studies as a whole, to embrace, among other things, the culture and contributions of Chinese women. Next, please. Why, I am now asking, have we in Chinese painting studies failed to do the same? Why do we still talk and write, that is, as though the doctrine or dogma of literati painting were somehow a central truth within our subject? instead of seeing it, as I recently have, as merely the self-serving rhetoric of a male elite minority. What about the rest of China, including women? What kinds of paintings do they support and enjoy? I hope I will live to witness that long overdue opening up of our field of study. The next, please. I've left unmentioned until now one of the previous Freer Medal recipients, my immediate predecessor in Chinese art, Sherman Lee. Sherman and I interacted more as contemporaries than as teacher and pupil. He was only eight years older than I, but I learned a great deal from him nonetheless. Among his strengths was an extraordinary breadth of knowledge, embracing the whole of Asian art and much of Western. He was the only museum person in our field who could compete in Chinese art connoisseurship with Larry Sickman without showing up badly in the comparison. Next, please. The first delegation of Chinese art scholars from the U.S. to uh, go to China after it was open to us. The Chinese archaeology delegation of 1973 called that because art history wasn't yet recognized as a legitimate field of study in China, was chaired by Sherman Lee. Here you see him in the center of this group, um, front and center, uh, with a bow tie holding his hat, smiling. Uh, other people next to him to the right is Larry Sickman, Behind us, uh, or behind and up of the top is myself. Over two to the right of that is Tom Lawton, whom Sherman Lee wisely chose as his co-chair. And then over on the upper left, uh, another Freer luminary, Tom Chase, who came along as our art science person. Next, please. 
Uh, here's a picture of Lee, Sickman, Tom Lawton, and others about to enter for the first time the gate to the Huihuaguan, the hall where paintings were displayed at the Palace Museum, a really historic moment in the history of Chinese art studies, I guess. Sherman Lee exhibited throughout this month-long, grueling trip his remarkable organizing ability. Besides making witty speeches at our banquets, and, next please, displaying his athletic skills. Here he plays ping-pong against our Chinese guide, losing only because, as we decided, any Chinese can beat any American at ping-pong, even one who was a former champion, as Sherman was. In later years, Sherman was to have his remarkable energy and eloquence reduced by several strokes and Parkinson's disease. His talk at the 1998 presentation to him of the Freer Medal was one of his last major public appearances. He was to make one more, however, about a year later, and it was on my behalf, and represented powerfully the strength of his commitment to things he believed in. He had been working with Thomas Krenz of the Guggenheim on a huge exhibition of Chinese art, but had to give that up when one of his strokes made it impossible for him to continue. The next, please. Meanwhile, the Metropolitan Museum had acquired and announced with a splash on the New York Times front page a painting titled Riverbank, which purported to be a 10th century work, even bearing the signature of the great landscape master Dungren. A few weeks later, a journalist friend of mine published a brief note in The New Yorker revealing that I believed it to be another forgery by Zhang Da Chen. I had in fact included it in a lecture on those given seven years earlier, with two of the painting's biggest believers, that is Wen Pong and Dick Bernhardt, in the audience, and shown why I took it to be Zhang's work. But other Chinese art specialists, even those who agreed with me, were reluctant to enter the public fray for reasons too complex to go into here, and I found myself quite isolated and under attack by partisans of the painting. Next, please. Taking my side openly was only my friend Hironobu Kohara in Japan, who had been the first to publish the opinion that Riverbank could not be early and must be a Zhang Da Chen forgery. But Kohara was far away and carried less weight than he should have. Next, please. Sherman Lee, when he learned about the situation, reportedly said, Jim is not alone, and came out of retirement, difficult as that was for him, to support me. If he had been a text reader, he would have followed up the textual clues that Zhang had planted, including spurious seals and a concocted provenance, which supplied a false history for the work. Instead, Sherman made his way to the Metropolitan Museum and spent some hours on each of two days sitting in front of the painting and gazing at it, and at the Issues of Authenticity in Chinese Painting Symposium held at the Met in December 1999, Sherman emerged again to speak briefly and haltingly, but incisively, showing the slide some features of style in the work that disqualified it altogether, in his view, as an early Chinese landscape. Next, please. He concentrated on the rendering of water in the painting, comparing it with that in a genuine 10th century work, the well-known hand, hand scroll by Zhao Gan. There, as he pointed out, quote, the pattern of the water is not uniform. When disturbed by a rock, the water breaks and flows differently, then runs swiftly along. It is a living thing, end quote. Next, please. In Riverbank, by contrast, he said, quote, nowhere does it dance and flatten in response to variations in the surface tension. It is not the shui observed in early works. Only a modern could fail to see the varying tension when observing water in nature, end quote. And after further observations about how the closer one looks at details, as he put it, the vaguer and more substantial they become, he concludes by calling the work, quote, a morass of starts, false starts, and half starts that point inexorably to a modern pastiche all too familiar to many of us, end quote. By that he was alluding to Zhang Da Chen's forgeries without naming him, as I knew from talking with him. No other person in the modern pastiche, all too familiar, etc. Uh, the next, please. While I have that detail on the screen, let me just point out, I'll have more on this in a kind of postlude to this, I think, but meanwhile, while I have that on screen, 
Look at the row of trees in the in the foreground at the bottom of Riverbank. Uh, two pines, crossed pine, tall pine trees to the left, and then some lower trees, leafy trees, different kinds, and then getting smaller as you go down uh, down to bushes, and then down below some lumpy topped uh, uh, rock forms or earth forms. Where does that come from? Is it in 10th century painting? Of course not. Where does it come from? Uh, if you know painting pretty well, you'll probably remember. Here, next please. Here is a opening section of a painting by Huang Gung Wang. And here, in reverse order, but still, you see the two tall pine trees and the other trees, leafy trees, and getting smaller and smaller, various kinds of trees and bushes. And then down below, the same uh, lumpy topped earth forms. In other words, Zhang De Chen pulls in things he remembers from various kinds of painting and puts them together. He's not too careful about about putting, making it all match in supposed period. Okay, next, let's go on now. Um, next, please. Sitting in the front row at the Met Symposium, making faces and saying aloud things like, ridiculous, as I myself spoke, were a group of prominent Chinese authorities, including Qi Gong, Yang Xin, seen here at the left, along with Wen Feng, and next, please, and Xi Xi Wang himself. He had been the previous owner of the painting, which he had bought directly from Zhang Da Chen. How can all these have been, as I believe, so wrong? The answer to that, my final observation, another reached late in my life, and another that many, many people will be disturbed by, is that the Chinese tradition of connoisseurship, based as it is in recognizing personal style and the hand of the artist, works best for the later periods of Chinese painting, Yuan and after, when these are prominent, that is, when you can recognize personal style in the hand of the artist. For those periods, which comprise most of the history of Chinese painting, as it can be known from extant works, Chinese connoisseurs are on the whole better than we are. But for some in earlier painting, when the artist's hand typically isn't there to see and identify, they can go badly wrong. And Zhang Da Chen understood this weakness and played against it in his forgeries, planting just those clues by which his Chinese contemporaries made their judgments, and which could be falsified in his fakes. I say this as one who has the deepest admiration for traditional Chinese connoisseurship, and who has tried to absorb some of its wisdom by learning from Xi Xi Wang and others throughout his long career. The next, please. On the screen, finally, is a Chinese portrait of me done by my artist friend Wan Ching Li for my 80th birthday, imagining me as a Chinese scholar. <coughs> it is time or past time to conclude, and I will do so by noting again that I began here at the Freer, a full Chinese cycle of years ago, as a student of that approach to Chinese painting that uses textual sources to construct the histories and contexts of the individual works and their artists, an approach that I have continued always to teach and support, while acknowledging that others can do it far better than myself. But I have also devoted a lot of time and argument to advocating a visual approach and trying to exemplify it. And in doing that, I have placed myself, I believe, within the great tradition of my freer metal predecessors in Chinese art, all of whom, in their different ways, were more object lookers than text readers. Thank you.